Good morning. We'll be in Luke chapter 6. There we go. Luke chapter 6 today. Last week we got to the end of chapter 5 where Jesus had the parable of the wineskins. Um, Kurt and I were talking about it afterwards and he said he feels like the wineskins represent the different types of followers. I think that's absolutely right. Uh, Jesus came with a new teaching and the old school guys, the Pharisees, the, uh, you know, old line skins, rigid, fixed, um, shaped by their own um, traditions and views would not accept Jesus' teaching. But a new kind of disciple, the new line skins were the ones who accepted that uh, teaching of Jesus and, but this sets up a great conflict that's going to run throughout the story between the kind of the old wineskins and the new wineskins. And the old wineskins are forever more upset with the new wineskins, with the way that uh, Jesus and his disciples were doing things. As we already saw last time, they were upset about um, things like fasting and eating and, and uh, even looking a little ahead in the story, washing their hands. And today we'll see another example as it just continues right into chapter 6 of a conflict uh, between these two. And this is one that's going to recur in various forms that it had to do with their um, observance of the Sabbath and their um, offense at Jesus and what he and his disciples would do on the Sabbath at times. So beginning in verse 1 of chapter 6, it says, On a Sabbath, while he was going through the grain fields, his disciples plucked and ate some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees says, Why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Let's just freeze frame right there and um, kind of get into the mindset of the Pharisees here. So, of course, we remember that the Sabbath was a day of rest. It was given to them, and it was one of the Ten Commandments. It was the Fourth Commandment. You remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And on that day, you're not doing any work, neither you nor your servants or anybody. You know, everybody was to stop working. And there's a lot of laws about that that emphasized this point and the importance of it. It was a capital offense. You may recall that shortly after uh, Moses gave the commandments and uh, not very long afterwards, they found a man picking up sticks and they kind of arrested him and held him till they could find out what was to be done. And the command was that he was to be stoned to death. So clearly this was a very um, important law, a very a serious law, one that was not to be ignored to rest on the Sabbath. Now, what does it re mean to rest? It, it means he, they, they were told you were not doing any work. So they had to understand that in order to um, live by it, you have to know what would constitute work, right? So um, for the Jews, they came up with 39 categories of what constituted work. And I've already forgotten, but there's a, of course, there's a Jewish name for these um, but they had these 39, these are ancient. I couldn't, I couldn't find out exactly how far back they go, if they go all the way back to Jesus' time or if they came in the tradition since then of the uh, rabbis. But they had these 39 categories of things that you were prohibited from doing on the Sabbath day. And notice um, a lot of them have to do with farming, agriculture. And in the middle of all those, you have reaping, harvesting, and threshing. Now, to understand what they meant by those categories, um, I, I, there's, I, I copied the information that's coming from this um, Orthodox Union website. There's several places you can go to find out. Like for modern Jews, if you wanted to try to live the, an observant um, Orthodox Jewish uh, lifestyle, you would need to learn, okay, what's this mean about Saturdays and what can I do and not do? So they kind of help you out by saying, let me give you some examples of what these categories of work that's prohibited on the Sabbath day. So when it comes to reaping, this is what their note says, or part of it anyway. Reaping includes cutting or plucking any growing thing. Uh, agriculture is again one of the main ways in which man shows his dominance over nature. This category is therefore one of those mentioned in the Torah or the Law of Moses, as we find in Exodus 34, 21. Six days you shall work, but you shall rest on the seventh. In plowing and harvesting, you shall rest. So they understood that one of the categories of things they were not allowed to do on the Sabbath day was um, farming kind of work, which makes sense, right? You couldn't do that. Such activities as plucking a flower, plucking a fruit from a tree come under this head. The same is true of mowing a lawn, okay? I'm sure that Jesus' disciples didn't ever think about that, but that's a modern concern, right? Can I cut the grass? 
Does anybody else ever grow up being told you're not really supposed to mow the yard? On my, Mom always would say she hates the sound of a lawnmower on a Sunday. <laughs> but that's kind of a carryover from this idea, I think. But um, it was also legislated that we do not handle any growing flowers or plants. It's also forbidden to climb a tree or smell a growing flower. Okay, maybe getting a little carried away, right? They're getting a little bit, can't smell the growing flower because that would somehow fall in, that doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and even this, look, fruit which falls from a tree on a Sabbath may not be eaten till the next day. Uh, so even though you didn't pluck it, if it fell on the ground and you pick it up, then somehow that falls under reaping. So, but you can see, all right, and I think if we can look at this a little bit lovingly, let's try to do that. It's easy to be critical, but let's try to look at it lovingly because they're, they're kind of like cousins, I think, you know, these observant Jews in a sense to us. And I think we can sort of see some of ourselves in that, in that they had this devotion to try to do the right thing. And so they were, they were trying to be very careful about doing the right thing. And given how serious the Sabbath command was, they certainly didn't want to do anything that even came close to doing a wrong thing. And so they, they, uh, they built up these definitions and these questions came up over the years and they were answered by some rabbi and that became part of the, their understanding of what it means to observe the Sabbath, all right? Now, it might seem kind of silly to us about smelling a flower, and I think it is silly, but um, it came from a place of trying to be careful to not break their rules about doing work on the Sabbath. So that's reaping, but you'll notice, of course, that specifically, no plucking, right? No plucking of any living thing. Now, the one about um, hard, oh, threshing. Threshing, this note says, this includes all operations where food is separated from its natural container. Both solid and liquid foods are included. The prime example is threshing grain to remove it from its husk. But it goes on to say this would also, uh, you know, you couldn't squeeze juice from a fruit. So you couldn't make like orange juice because that's, that falls under threshing because you're getting something out of it. You're having to put work into it to get separated. And so you also couldn't thresh, uh, which is part of farming, especially in a grain kind of thing. You know, you get the harvesting and bringing it in and then they would beat it or, or, you know, do things like that to get the hull away so that you get to the part that's edible. And so all that stuff was considered farming work. Now, besides smelling a flower, picking up a plant off the ground, I mean, a, a fruit off the ground, can you at least kind of follow, follow the logic of what, what they're saying? I mean, I understand it. It's, a, it's, it's not completely ridiculous. You're not allowed to work. Well, what does that mean? Well, you can't do any farming. What does that mean? You can't do any planting or plowing or reaping or threshing. These are things that go along with agricultural work. You're supposed to not do that on the Sabbath day. I think we would all say, okay, if I, I, I can... I, I follow the reasoning there. So with that in mind, can you see why when they see Jesus and his disciples walking along on Saturday and they're scooping up some of the heads of grain in their hands and then rubbing them to get the husk off and then eating that, that they would be like, that's not love. Can you follow the logic? I can, I mean, I can see why they took, I can see why they arrived at the conclusion that that was forbidden, um, that should not have been done on the Sabbath day. Were they right about that? <laughs> um, I think we'll see in a moment that we can say they were wrong to condemn Jesus' disciples. Jesus says that himself. So we'll get to that in just a little bit. They were wrong to condemn Jesus' disciples. Were, would they be wrong to abstain from doing those things themselves? Obviously not but they were wrong to condemn Jesus' disciples for what they were doing. Now, how would you expect, okay, knowing nothing else about this, if we just press pause there, and so they say to Jesus, why are they doing that? That's, a, that's against the law. If you had to finish the story, not knowing how it goes, what would you expect Jesus to say in response to that? Well, here's some options that I could imagine. One, he looks around and says, what are you guys doing? You know, don't do that. We're not supposed to do that on the Sabbath. You know, maybe he would agree with them and tell the disciples, quit doing it. Quit picking the grain. It's the Sabbath day. That's one possibility, right? Like, what if the, if the Pharisees were right, then Jesus would probably rebuke the people who were doing that. It says it was his disciples, not him. He doesn't do that. Um, another thing you might, let's say the Pharisees are wrong, right? So they're either right or they're wrong. Let's say that they're wrong. Wouldn't you expect then 
Jesus to explain to them why they were mistaken. That's what I would expect. So if they're saying, hey, that's illegal, but let's say that they're wrong about that, I would expect Jesus to say, actually, this is not the kind of thing that was prohibited by the law. This is not work. This is just eating. You've gone too far, like that smell flower, pick up a fruit. You know, you've kind of gone a little too far. You need to reel it back in. You're, you're, um, you've, but he doesn't do that either. He doesn't explain to them why they were wrong. In fact, he cites an Old Testament example that's a very curious one, I think, in my opinion. It's hard to understand exactly why this is the, the way that he uh, goes with this. So the example is from the life of David. Let's continue reading there in Luke 6, verse 3. Jesus answered them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him how he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those with him. Okay. This is really difficult, uh, to me anyway. This, whole, this, this little passage is difficult. They say, the Pharisees say, why are they doing what's unlawful? And Jesus responds to that, haven't you read where David did what was unlawful? Right. So, and he doesn't finish the sentence in a way, like he doesn't complete the thought to say, so what are you saying? Like, David did something that was also unlawful. Now what? What, what does he mean by that? Well, let's go back and read this account in 1 Samuel 21, and we'll come back and look at some more things that Jesus says and see if we can uh, come to a better understanding of it. 1 Samuel 21 I don't think this is going to shed a lot of light on the question just reading this, but at least we'll have the account that Jesus is referring to fresh in our minds. Verses 1 through 6. David came to Nob. This is when he's running away. Right before this is when, you remember Jonathan had to like shoot an arrow and one, one minute go and one minute stay and all that. So this is when he says, you got to go. Dad's mad at you. And so Saul's trying to kill David, so he runs away. Uh, David came to Nob to Ahimelech the priest. And Ahimelech came to meet David trembling and said to him, why are you alone and no one with you? David said to him, like the priest, the king has charged me with a matter and said to me, let no one know anything about of the matter of which I send you and with which I have charged you. I have made an appointment with the young men for, for such, such and such a place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever is here. The priest answered David, I have no common bread on hand, but there is holy bread. If the young men have kept themselves from women. And David answered the priest, truly women have been kept from us always when I go on an expedition. The vessels of the young men are holy even when it's an ordinary journey. How much more today when will their vessels be holy? So the priest gave him the holy bread, for there was no bread there but the bread of the presence, which is removed from before the Lord to be replaced by hot bread on the day that is taken away. Okay, it, it, you know, instead of kind of clarifying now what was meant by this, it almost gets more difficult the more we go, doesn't it? Because we wonder, like, well, it, you know, Sarah and I were discussing, it seems like David, is he being honest with Ahimelech when he talks about being sent on a special secret mission by the king? It doesn't seem like that's true, unless there's some information we're missing. Where's these young men? Um, they, what is this meaning of if they've stayed away from women? Why is that kind of important to the story? But Jesus doesn't mention, the only thing Jesus mentions is the, the fact that he goes in and gets this bread. So I think those other details are not important to this question about the uh, grain. The thing that Jesus cites is, have it, don't you know that David went and he got some of the bread that was forbidden to him and he ate of it? So was that okay? Is, there's two ways to read what Jesus is saying here. One way is, that they say, hey, why are you doing what's wrong? Why are you doing something that's illegal on the Sabbath? And Jesus says, well, look, David did something illegal too. Is he saying, well, because it was okay for David, it's okay for us? Is that what they're supposed to take from that? Or is he saying, as I heard growing up, well, you guys give David a pass, and David was doing something he shouldn't do, but you're scrutinizing my disciples, you're being hypocrites or inconsistent. That's the way I've always heard it explained. Maybe that does, maybe that is a little more palatable. 
But we, it's hard for me to tell for sure from just what we have written down which way Jesus means that to be. But the question is, in both cases, in the case of David, the priest Ahimelech made an exception to the rule in a circumstance where David was hungry and David was in need of food. And so even this was not technically allowed, the priest showed mercy to David and gave him some food. That's what happened. Now we would sit back and say, okay, so class, is that okay? Right? So now we could argue about that. We could say, well, you take the side that says he should have done it, and you take the side that he should have done it, so we could have a big debate. And this is the kind of thing the rabbis would do all the time, is they would just kind of argue, you know, back and forth about one thing or another. Um, should he have done that? Was it okay? But in the end, who really gets to say whether it was okay or not? It's not really up to us to decide in a sense, right? That would be up to God to decide. Now, let's, keep, let's go back to Luke 6 and keep reading. And notice what uh, Jesus says. So I'm going to put these passages on the screen here to highlight. So Jesus, here's Jesus' response. Remember they said, hey, why are they doing what they shouldn't do? Jesus says, have you not read where David did when he was hungry? I think that's important that it keeps mentioning he was hungry. So there was a legitimate need. He and those who were with him. How he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. And he also gave it to those with him. And Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. So how, how is that connected to this, if it is? Well, well the, the question, question is one of, are your followers doing something that is allowed or forbidden? That's the question, right? That's what we're trying to get at here. Why are they doing what the, the Pharisees felt like they were breaking the law? But when it comes to interpreting the Sabbath, whose say is the final say on the matter? We could debate, right? Is it lawful to pick the grain and rub it? Is that breaking the law or is it not breaking the law? Well, you might have an opinion one way or the other. The Jews could argue that one way or the other. But the fact is, there is a lawgiver and there is a judge, and it's his decision is the only one that will matter in the end. And when Jesus says the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath, he's making a claim that only God can make. That's a, that, that shows his divinity. No person could ever say, I'm Lord of this. I'm over the whole Sabbath. Who could do that? Only the lawgiver, only the judge, only, only God, God could say, I'm Lord of the Sabbath. So it's a very striking claim. But it also shows that Jesus himself is the one who interprets and explains and executes and will judge people based on that law. And I think the implication is, they're with me, right? So if the followers are with Jesus and he's allowing it, then it's not breaking the Sabbath because he's Lord of the Sabbath. Um, perhaps you could imagine being like a, a security guard at the arsenal down in Huntsville. And uh, you see some people and you think, hey, why are you over there? You're not supposed to be over there. And when they turn around, it's the president of the United States, you know, and his secret service and some advisors. And you're like, oh, oh yeah, sorry, I didn't realize who I was talking to. Because he can go where he wants to. I mean, like, he's the president. He has the authority to go. And it might look like to you at first glance that they're doing something they shouldn't be doing. But when you understand who it is, you realize, okay, they're, they're authorized. Um, but this isn't exactly parallel to that. But they, they don't realize they're talking to the one who is the Lord of the Sabbath. And so that's the first thing that Jesus says about that. And we'll come back to that um, in a moment when we make some uh, application of this. Now, this account is in the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They all record it. They all have the same reference to the, um, what David did. But after that, they each add a different thing that Jesus also said. So let's look at the others, and we'll kind of combine these together. So in Mark, here's Mark's account in Mark chapter 2. He said to them, have you ever read what David did when he was hungry, in need and hungry? That adds a, even more emphasis on the fact that this was a genuine case of need. He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who are with him. And he said to them, here's a new thing. The Sabbath was made for man, not, not man, man for the, the Sabbath. Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. 
So this phrase in bold there is new in this uh, in Mark's account. Um, the Sabbath. So in the order of creation, man was first, and then God rested. You know, man was made on the sixth day, God rested on the seventh day, and then sometime later God gives them the Sabbath. The Sabbath was meant to be for them. It was a blessing. It was for man's good. It was something that would be helpful and needful for, um, man, I have a quote here. For this is from Barnes again. He says, um, the Sabbath was for his rest from toil, his, talking about man, his rest from the cares and anxieties of the world to give him an opportunity to call off his attention from earthly concerns and direct it to the affairs of eternity. I love how those old guys can write like that. You know, it's so beautiful. But this, in other words, the Sabbath was given for man. It was a blessing. It was to be something that was helpful. It was to give and really require people to take a break from the mundane every day and to rest, which would give you time for prayer, for contemplation, for thinking, for being with family, for those kind of things. It was good for... And by the way, even though we understand that the Sabbath was part of their law and it's not, did not carry over as a requirement, I think we can still see that there is value in a day of rest. There's value in taking time away, stopping the grind to pray and reflect, rest. God knows what's good for us. And that was given as a blessing to man. But it was not meant to be it was not that the Sabbath was made and then man was made to serve it. That's the point Jesus is making. The, Sab they, the Jews had this kind of backwards. They, they had the Sabbath as kind of the end all be all. And that it's kind of like our purpose here to, to be sure that we observe it, even at the cost of causing suffering and denying um, mercy and hospitality and, and kindness. But it was never meant to do that. In the next passage in Luke, which we won't go into today, there's a man with a withered hand, and he comes in, and they're watching Jesus because it's Sabbath. They're going to see if he's going to heal him, and Jesus looks around at him, and he says, is it, you tell me, is it lawful to do good or to do harm, to harm, you know, to heal or to kill on the Sabbath? And they, nobody would answer because they couldn't say. That's ridiculous. They should have known. Of course, it's always lawful to do the right thing. It's always lawful to show kindness. It's always lawful to help and to show mercy but in their minds, the Sabbath overruled all that. So like you had to, you couldn't even help a hurt person or, you know, they, they had this view that put the Sabbath as kind of the ultimate law. And he's saying, no, it wasn't. That, that is, the Sabbath was given for man. Man was not made for the Sabbath. Interesting, right? Luke's count, uh, sorry, Matthew's. Matthew's adds two things. First, he adds another example. In Matthew's account, Matthew 12, after talking about David and what David did, he adds another. Or, have you not read of the law how the Sabbath, on the Sabbath, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. Um, in this case, I, what the priests do is they continue working even on Saturday because the law required certain offerings to be made every day. So they offered sacrifices on the Sabbath, which meant they had to kill. They had to do things that would have been considered forbidden to anybody else. But because they were priests and because they were serving God in the temple and offering sacrifices on behalf of the people, their work, although it profaned the Sabbath in a sense because they were working, but their work was authorized. They were not. They were guiltless. They weren't guilty of breaking the law because it was in service of God. It was work done in the temple. That makes sense, right? But notice the powerful point Jesus makes in verse 6. Something greater than the temple is here. Now, I, I would suggest very few people who are probably not even the disciples understood everything Jesus was saying. It's hard. We don't even, it's hard to wrap your head around all this. But I, what he was saying here was that as much as they emphasis they placed on the temple, standing out there in the middle of this grain field, someone greater than the temple was standing in their presence. The inhabitant of the temple. Right? And so, if serving the temple was authorized, even though it might take on a form that looks like work on the Sabbath day, 
then certainly serving one who is greater than the temple would be authorized if that's what you're doing. If their, if their activity served him, that's a higher purpose. Just like the priests have a higher purpose that allows them to do work that someone else would not be allowed to do because they're doing it in service to God in his temple. If these disciples are following Jesus and they're with him and they're doing something for him, then that you know, is, supersedes, I think, this restriction that the um, Pharisees are talking about. At least that's what I think he's saying. There. One more thing in Matthew. And he says, the next verse, if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Okay, notice here, guiltless. So we all understand the priests who were working on the Sabbath day in the temple were guiltless. They were not guilty. He, he says the same thing is true of his followers. And he says, you made a mistake. You condemned the guiltless. That's why I say, I think we can say for sure that what they were doing was not, did not make them guilty as lawbreakers because Jesus clears them here. He exonerates them. Who exonerates them? The Lord of the Sabbath. So whatever our opinion is, suddenly it doesn't make any difference because the Lord of the Sabbath says they're guiltless, right? And if the Lord of the Sabbath says they're guiltless, then it doesn't matter what anybody else thinks because he's the one that has the authority. And so they're guiltless in the same way the priests were guiltless. But he also rebukes the Pharisees and says, you made a mistake in your judgment. In your judgment, you condemned someone who was guiltless. That's what Job's friends are doing, right? Job's friends condemned a guiltless man. They made an error in their judgment. And Jesus says, you made an error in your judgment, but you could have prevented that. You could have not made that mistake if you had remembered something else. There's a principle that you forgot that if you had kept in mind, you would not have made the mistake you made. And that principle is, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. In the priority of things, for the Jews, sacrifice or worship was like the ultimate thing. So following all these rules about, that was like the ultimate thing. To the point that they lost sight of mercy. Jesus says, if you hadn't done, if you hadn't made that mistake, you wouldn't have made this mistake. So how would that principle have played out in this circumstance? I think this goes back to why in all three cases, when he points to David, he says he was hungry. Right. So the priest, David comes to him and David is hungry and the priest made an exception to this rule about the bread and gave some to David to satisfy his hunger. When these guys saw Jesus' disciples in the grain in the field eating, all they could see was they're breaking the Sabbath, they're breaking the Sabbath, they're doing something wrong, right? That's like they couldn't see past that. What they didn't see was just hungry men, right? They had no compassion. They had no sympathy. They, they did not make any allowance for them the fact that they're just eating. They're not trying to work. They're not, they're, so they looked at it through a very rigid, hard, cold, kind of analytical, here's the instructions, and you're breaking number B.3.4.5 that says you can't do this thing and pluck something, right? But they lost all sight of mercy and compassion. And Jesus said, that's why you made the mistake. That's why you got your judgment wrong and you condemned people who were guiltless. Challenging, right? I think, anyway. Applying all this. Let's think about how this might apply to us today. I think all the time, maybe the wheels have already been turning in your mind, um, we do kind of what the Jews did a lot in the sense that, so we have these principles we try to live by. And that we're given by the Lord, the New Testament principles that we have to abide by. And it's necessary in some ways to try to figure out how we're going to apply those things. So along with that, we kind of come up with some judgments about things. Some tack onto that, some traditions, and pile onto that, some opinions. And then you come up with this whole setup, right? This is what it means to do it the right way. Uh, which at the core of that is probably some principles that the Lord gave us, but then maybe kind of piled on top of that is kind of how we've always done it and some other things like that. And then you see somebody who does something that, ooh, I wouldn't do it that way. That's not how I'm used to doing it. 
that's not, not how, how we want to do it. it. And so we might be tempted to say, you're wrong, you're sinning, you're breaking the law, but are they really, or are they just breaking my tradition or, or my, uh, you know, how I've always done it or whatever? Well, that, that takes some study and thought. What we don't want to do, though, and we would never want to do, is condemn a guiltless person, right? We wouldn't want to say somebody is sinning when, in fact, they're not sinning. They're A-OK -okay with the Lord. That puts me in the wrong, right? So how can we avoid making the mistake the Pharisees made? Well, we can remember these things from these passages we just looked at. First of all, Jesus says, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Let's look at uh, 1 Corinthians 4. There are some judgments which we should leave to the Lord. There are judgments which we should let the judge make. There are times when we should withhold condemning someone, when we should withhold our own judgment. Starting in verse uh, 1. 1 Corinthians 4. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards they be found faithful. But with me, it's a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I'm not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and disclose the, hid the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. So there are judgments which we are to not make. It would have been better for the Pharisees to go, <laughs> you know, and maybe they could ask, right? Is it okay? Is that all right? Are you, are you sure they're supposed to be doing the thing with the, um, you know, there was a, there'd be a way to do that if they weren't sure, but their mistake was going, Wah. you know, they, they condemn these men who were actually, actually innocent when in fact the Lord of the Sabbath was with them. So they were actually, they were, on, they were with the Lord and whatever these guys said didn't have any bearing on the truth of the matter. On the flip side of that, I think there, were, there will be times when maybe like, if we're like Job, you might have friends who accuse you of wrong or think you're doing the wrong thing or don't agree with something you're doing. But the fact is, if we're with the Lord, it doesn't matter what, it, that's, what that's what Paul's saying. It matters very little to me, Paul says, what you think or any human court thinks, because I, I don't even answer to myself. I answer to the Lord. He's the judge. He's the only one whose opinion matters in the end. And if I'm okay with him, then it, it doesn't matter what you think about me. And these guys were with Jesus, and if Jesus is okay with what they're doing, it doesn't matter what the Pharisees think, really, about it, whether they're offended or not offended, because they're with the Lord of the Sabbath. So for us... Our goal should be, I want to follow the Lord, and if I'm with the Lord and I'm following him and he's leading me, then the rest of the world can like it or not like it, or people can condemn me or praise me, but none of that really makes any difference because the only one we have to answer to in the end is the Lord, and that's who's going to judge us. So that's point number one, and, and whether we're the one or whether we're the one wanting to criticize, I think we need to remember that. Who has authority? Who is the judge? Who's going to interpret the law in the end? Secondly, they're already on the screen. Jesus pointed out that they had lost sight of the real purpose. They, they got their, you know, the, the Sabbath kind of all out of whack. And he says, you know, man was made, the Sabbath was made for man, not the other way around. And so I think he was calling them in, in several places to go read the scriptures, to go ponder them, to be reminded of what these things really meant. And sometimes in service of uh, tradition or, you know, the way things have always been and that kind of stuff, we, we might lose sight of the actual intent of the thing. And how do we prevent that from happening? Well, it just takes kind of always going back and reading and trying to make sure that we don't ever uh, become unmoored from the actual heart of it all, what it's telling us, what it's about. And we could know that we do that if we ever lose sight of the more important weightier matters of the law, like mercy. If we ever become unmerciful in our judgment, then we've lost, we've, you know, thrown out the baby with the bathwater. We, we've lost sight of what really matters. So mercy is um, more important than sacrifice. And Jesus said, if you had known what this means, you would not have made your mistake in judging. Um, an example of this that I'll share just to 
this is my opinion. I think this is an example of that. I don't know that it's a perfect example, but it's one that popped in my mind as I was thinking about all this. I had a friend who was going through a really difficult uh, family situation, super bad, struggling, marriage falling apart. Um, wife was unfaithful and leaving him, and you know he had to, so he had these little bitty kids, and um, you know he was really it was like he was a terrible time in his life, and he was reaching out for help, and he was asking anybody that could to help, and he wasn't getting a lot of support from um, you know people, but. If he missed, if he was not there on a Wednesday night, his phone would be ringing. We didn't see you tonight. And it would be because maybe the kids were just like at their wits end or they're tired or he had been at work and now he's trying to take care of them too. And, you know, he just couldn't make it, couldn't get there. But, you know, the call was not a call to say, hey, how can I help? The call was not a call to say, can we support you? Is there some way we can be there for you? The call was like, you weren't in your place. And I don't know if that's the same thing as this or not. But I think sometimes we can become so focused on like, well, this has to be this way. And if we ever lose sight of love and mercy and compassion and care, if we lose sight of that in service to some um, idea that might actually be a tradition in the end, if you really boil it down, we could, we could become guilty of making the same mistake I think that these Pharisees made. So, I didn't even think about how to turn that into an invitation. But let's just think about that. We're all going to stand before the judge one day. And uh, he's going to, we're going to have to answer to him. You and me. And my, my opinion, your opinion won't matter at all. They, even as Paul said, his own opinion of himself isn't what matters. It's what the Lord says. We, we can, can be right, right with him, though. And we can know, know that, that we're following him if we, we do what he tells us to do in his, in his word. word. Perhaps, Perhaps there's someone here this morning who needs to make that commitment and give your life to the Lord. If you've never been baptized, of course, that would be the first step in that if you have and you've fallen away and you'd like the prayers of the church, please let us know as we stand and sing.